What's up, guys? This is David, A.K. Reverse Long, and today I have uh, Jack Schwager back on the podcast. The legendary author of The Market Wizards, The Hedge Fund Market Wizards, The Unknown Market Wizards, and several other books. Um, he has uh, recently released a new version of the updated version of The Unknown Market Wizards, which we'll get into. And yeah, so first, uh, first, Jack, thanks for coming on the podcast. Once again, this is the third time uh, The Friendly Bear has had Jack uh schwager on the podcast so like if you haven't seen the last two episodes i think it's great to see it because we did one in one 2021 and one uh i think january this year or it was over the around a year ago actually and um it's great to see and especially for me personally is like you get this, like my questions to jack uh i don't i don't know if he, jack knows this but like i have grown as a trader so like I, my questions in 2021 you got to see, like, I'm asking questions that are, like, newer trader questions. In 2022, I, I asked a little bit more in depth because, you see, these are questions that I personally want to know. I've read all of Jack's books. I had them all on audio, especially, and uh, I've listened to them multiple times. So I'm getting takeaways, and I'm getting, and I'm, I'm writing them down. I'm asking Jack to grow as a trader myself so whoever's listening that, you know, can apply that for their own growth, you know, so... So Jack, welcome back once again. It's a pleasure having you on. Uh, it's it's was sir, yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I don't know if you know the first time I had you was it was like super surreal. I was like, wow, the Market Wizards author Jack Schwager. But now he's like, you know, we I've had you on a couple of times. It's kind of calmed down <laughs> the, you know, the the surrealness. But uh, but yeah, w welcome back once again. And um, yeah, how you been? I've been good, thanks. Awesome. So Jack, uh, for those that haven't watched the last two podcasts that we did what um okay so first you want to maybe introduce yourself what's your version of your introduction of, into the markets and what got you to start the market wizard series yeah well the, the market wizard series uh i i this goes back all the while the first market wizards book was written in 88 came out in 89 uh so it goes back quite a while um i had the idea to do the book. I was a research director at the time. I had done an analytical book, uh, like a 750-page analytical book, which was for a different audience and was good for what it was. Uh, but I had the, I wanted to do a book that was more general audience. However, I didn't really have time being a research director. Is, uh, more, you know, it's, a, it's, it's more than an eight-hour job by itself. So um, what happened was, and I don't know if we talked about this last time or not, but I got invited to, to lunch, uh, by a publisher who would, was familiar with my original analytical book and wanted me to do a whole bunch of, you know, be sort of an editor in chief for a series of analytical books. And I told him I had no interest. I'd taken a sabbatical to do that other book. It was a lot of work and, and I, you don't do that type of book to, to sell a lot of copies. Uh, you, you do it for other reasons. Anyway, I had no, I had done it. I didn't want to do it again. Uh, I said, but I, I had this idea for this book. And I, I guess I had the idea because I knew some great traders. And I just, had, I don't know where I first thought of it or whatever. It just seemed like, gee, it'd be, be kind of a fun idea to to go around the country and interview interview great traders and how to do it and try to pick their brains. And uh, it seemed like a fun project plus a good a good idea for a book. Uh, but I never did it because I was just too busy. So that that pub, that editor said, um, yeah, you know, well, well, why don't you do that? And kind of was the catalyst to get me going on it. And once I did one, I never never thought about doing more than one. But the first one was ended up being super successful. And I knew other traders that I didn't put in the first book. And oh, I figured, oh, I might as well do another one a few years later. So I did, I did a, the second one. The new market wizards, and the others. There were three others that came. It was from roughly about a seven-year span between each. Awesome. Yeah, I always find it interesting to to know the backstory behind that. And also, um, I want to ask you about again about Michael Marcus. Yeah, it was it was Michael Marcus uh, for Commodities Corp. So you started as a trader in Commodities Corp, and uh, yeah, where was that based out of, and how long were you trading? And then okay, like... so I wasn't. I, I actually I was a commodities corp for a year, um, uh, just as Michael as a researcher for Michael Marcus. Uh, I see. I wasn't, okay. a, I wasn't a trader at at, at commodities corp, um, but commodities corp is a very interesting story. 
Uh, it goes back, you know, I guess they got started in the, uh, maybe as early as the 70s. Uh, yeah, probably as early as the 70s. And originally it was founded by this, uh, um, this PhD um, who had this idea of just hiring a bunch of PhDs and they'd make a lot of money. And uh, his name was Helmut Weimar, and he had written a book. He had written a book on the cocoa market, but it was very, very obtuse. In fact, there's a line paraphrasing Michael Marx in the first interview. Uh, you know, Michael said, "Well, he wrote a book is so complicated, I couldn't understand the cover." You know, it, was, it just. Uh, but that was that was the that was he was that type of person. He was a very quant oriented person. Michael was quite the opposite. He 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 was a psychology major. Uh, he wasn't a math guy at all. Um, and when he interviewed for Commodities Corp, they it kind of was like a joke. They, you know, he said, well, what, what does he do? You know, sort of, what, what is his, what is his, uh, his career, his, his uh, resume like? And he says, he just trades. And they thought that was funny. But he, of course, ended up being the best trader they ever had. And he brought in, he ended up hiring Bruce Kovner, which showed, he had great instincts for also, for also recognizing other great traders, and the, the, at that in those years, he and Kovner and some other traders, none none as none as great as those two, uh, were were you know making like a lot of money as uh, as he, as trading commodities and uh, futures basically, uh, and in those days that was kind of a more of a unique thing, hedge funds. Hedge funds um, and CTAs who, who traded commodities sort of came around and grew a lot. But back then they were, I don't know if they were the first, but they were very early on in, in that type of prop trading. Interesting. So what I understand about Michael Marcus also, so before he joined Commodities Corp, he was trading on his own. And I, I remember him, uh, it took him like 10 years to become profitable. And he even traded his, uh, his he got uh, like a loan from his mom um, for $20,000, I believe. And he, he was very stressed out for trading. And so I think he lost that actually. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, why do you think it took him so long? And also like, what do you think is the, un and then he ended up being the best one, the best, you know, and he had even instincts to find Bruce Kovner. So what do you think was the main quality behind that? What drove him? Was it confidence? Was it persistence? Was it like resilience? Like what, yeah. what was it? It was the thing that drove him. He just had, this confidence, which, as he was telling me his whole story, seemed to be very unjustified because he went through, as you mentioned, some enormous failures. And uh, But I asked him in the interview, didn't you ever think that maybe you just weren't cut out for this? And he said, no, I just kind of looked up and I just thought, I can, you know, I, he just, I could do this, you know. I just believed that he eventually could do it. And his, his, his talent, in my, in my opinion, his talent was... He had great instincts uh, for the market. He just had a great intuition. Now, what got in his way, of course, like early on, he had no knowledge, no experience. And like most newbie traders, uh, no understanding of risk management. So if you look at all his early fail failures, they were more or less always uh, a matter of some form of risk management failure, you know, betting it. Betting, betting, betting everything on on one idea and going bad. So um, I think once he he learned he learned the importance of risk management, and then an experience and his natural intuitive instincts. Uh, I mean, he talked uh, like one of the stories in the first interview. He he was kind of a night owl and around two a.m. watching the TV. A news flash. He's watching see you know one of the news channels, and a news flash comes that the Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan. So he instantaneously picks up the call a uh, phone, calls Hong Kong, and buys hundreds hundreds of lots of gold. And uh, of course, the sellers are the floor there, and uh, they he joked about that he couldn't show his face there because they 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 still hate him, you know, because uh, he was on the other side of that trade. But he just instantaneously the market took off. But he's he just had those instincts, you know, that just react, uh, and uh, that's that's one of the things I think that made him great. And and the, those were trending markets. He was very good, at, which he learned from Ed Sakoda, who's never interviewed. 
in that first book. But Etzikota was was great at riding trends. And I think he learned from Etzikota that importance of riding trends, where he like one, one story, the soybean market went to new all time highs. He was long, Ed was long. And he figured, well, that's good, you know, good profits. And then uh, then Ed stayed with the trade because there was no reason to get out. And it just kept on going up and up. And there was a period of no one to limit, 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 every day, limit up, limit up. And, and that drove Marcus crazy. That was more painful to him than probably any loss he took. Just this thing that he had this trade, he got out, and there's Ed every day seeing the limit up gains. And, but I think that that experience burned in him this this importance of, of when does a potential for a major trend uh, and he's on that right side to stay with it. And so that was another thing. He, he had those big trending markets in those years and that, that helped him get those incredible profits. So interesting. So you mentioned Ed Sakota. So from what I understand, Ed Sakota, I think was uh, like a quantitative or short or um, systematic for the most part. Is that true? Yeah, he was systematic. He was uh yeah, and I'm trying to, he was, an, I think, an engineer by background, uh, by education. And, uh, you know, it was early into programming. And uh, this is back in the, this is back in the 70s. I think it was the 70s. I don't know, the 60s, 70s. And and Ed uh, basically finagled his way. He needed a computer. And this is, we're talking today. This, and I, I can, I can emphasize it totally because this is my day as well. You know, Ed and I are probably similar age. Uh, but I remember my senior year in college um, doing, taking a, uh, well, I was taking a, a programming, I think it was for economics or a program, but I was doing it probably some sort of economic course because I remember I was doing the modeling of the U.S. economy and uh, and he had to do these punch cards and it was just the IBM 360 and it was like occupied a, a you know, small room and this was, you know, that was that was the computer in those days, and uh, so uh, you know, and Ed worked on the same computer. So he finagled his way into a job, so he would have access to the computer on weekends and could program systems. And he was really just programming pretty straightforward trend following systems. But in that day, nobody was doing that, and so he was kind of in the vanguard. Uh, many years later, years later. It became there was all the software and everybody, everybody's doing the same thing. Those systems no longer have the, anything like the same. They no longer can work like that. But when he was doing it, uh, he was one of the only people doing it that way, and uh, he was ahead of the game. So interesting. So I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So Ed Sakota, he was working or something for MIT, and MIT had at the time had access to the computer Deep Blue. It occupied like an entire room, and he would he would work off that. So I, the reason why I'm asking is I find it so interesting that Michael Marcus, a discretionary trader that went by a lot of intuition and this kind of thing, got, you know, got a lot of uh, ideas from right now from what I'm getting from what I'm understanding from Ed Sakota, who's quantitative system engineering background, systematic approach. So there, he's able to see things from like many different ways. So I wanted to ask you, too, because I, I remember you mentioned uh, last time that we um yeah, you had a lot, you used to have lunch with Michael Marcus several, like all the time and, um, or very often uh, for a period of time. And uh, I wanted to ask you, what was like a quality that you saw? Like you mentioned he's intuitive. Like, was he like very intense? Was he focused? Was he excited? Was he obsessed with the markets? Like what, you know, because like in order to like at two in the morning, he sees an idea of the Soviet Union getting invaded or something. It's like, he calls Hong Kong. Like, you know, like you gotta be like a really, um, eccentric in a way you know to just love the yeah, market michael, michael was a bit eccentric and um um and he was you know in a way in his own way a bit odd in certain ways and you know um and i think that was part of his i think that was part of the reason he was talented you know, people have different talents and things like that and and often people with the biggest talents in certain areas may be maybe kind of an old odd in, in other ways. And I guess in Michael might, you know, might fit that that description. Uh, he was a he was a shy guy. Uh, um, he would get immersed into things. Uh, yeah. And and many years later he did uh, years later he did 
he did suffer from mental illness. And so I don't know, you know, if if that somehow is related to, you know, to to his talent, you know. Uh, I mean, it ended up being negative, but I don't know early on if he had some sort of quirk in his, in his mind that sort of gave him an edge, but later on led to, to you know, uh, uh, mental, me mental problems. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know him. I didn't see him for, uh, he died this past year. I didn't see him for the last, the last time I saw him was probably, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen years ago, maybe even longer. Uh, so it was a while. And even at that point, I was seeing, you know, maybe early signs of it. But I understand from what I've read that he did lapse into, into you know, more serious problems. Yes, that's, that's tough to hear. But, uh, but you know, it's I, I always like revisiting Michael Marcus because first, he's, he's the first chapter in Market Wizards from what I remember. And also his story of like 10 years of unprofitability. He borrows money from his mom in order to trade. Like he really, he really is like, really has the drive to succeed and has believes in himself that much. And it's, it's inspiring to a lot of traders that are, you know, struggling and uh, that, you know, that, that really believe in themselves and they can do it. And you're, you know, it's just a frustrating process. So I always like to start with that and just find out more because you knew him very well. Um, another question I wanted to ask you was, what do you think was a commonality of like a market wizards. The market wizards are like are what you're looking for is dramatic performance, extraordinary performance, and this is why you you came up with these uh the the interviewees, right? The the market wizard interviews. So like, what was the commonality? Like, what background did they have? Like middle class. Which ones I like were wealthy to start with, and how many of them were like lower class or or poor? You know, they, um, they came from you know really the whole spectrum of of economic background. So, you know, a number came from poor backgrounds or, you know, lower middle class, and some came from, you know, more well, you know, well off, well off backgrounds. Uh, um, their backgrounds are pretty different and their characters and personalities are pretty different. Uh, but they share, I mean, they, there's probably an intensity of focus um, that uh, is common among among most of them, and uh, a passion for, you know, a passion for trading, which is, I think, really important. And uh, you have to, uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't have that passion. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I, I trade as a sideline sometimes, sometimes I don't trade, but trading, oddly enough, has never been a, it's been central in my life because of books and jobs and things, you know, things like, and even my hobby sometimes, but, but it hasn't been my, my passion. I never, I never, I mean, maybe many years ago, maybe when I first thought, I said, gee, maybe I'd be like, but like everybody thinks that, well, that's a, that's a sexy thing to do, you know, be a trader or whatever, but you have to, and when you're actually doing it, you have to have that, First of all, yeah, I, I never felt I was a good trader or would be a great trader. Uh, I, you know, initially I thought, well, yeah, this would be good if I could really be good at it. But I decided, no, I, I'm not, that's not going to be, that's not where I was meant. I wasn't a born trader. Uh, I think the people I interview in many cases are. They're just, they find themselves, they could have done something else, but oddly enough, they end up in trading and then find out they they have this this great talent for it. And, uh, not that they, in most cases, they never thought about it. Uh, they just end up in, the, for one reason, they, like Marcus, Marcus just learns about trading from some some other guy in college and, you know, gets enamored of it that way. But it's not like they grew up wanting to be traders. Or if you did, people like Steve Cohen, and there's, there, there are quite a few who, who started trading in high school. And, and that is actually a tell of somebody who's probably going to be good that I find uh, that if, if somebody started trading in high school, they usually end up being pretty good because it's that deep in their, in their nature. Um, the, 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 the other things, they, they tend to be flexible people, you know, uh, um, uh, they're, they're able to change their mind, which is very, very critical in, in trading. So 
they can believe one thing uh, and then then change around completely do something different. I mean, I, I think when I when I interviewed Steve Cohen two different on two separate interviews uh, a couple of weeks apart, one who one the first time I'm there, he's all bullish. I forget it was I think it was the bond market or stock market. I don't remember. Let's say it's the bond market, and and uh, the next time I'm there, he's all bearish to say market. And it's like it, it's there's there's no that's they they're able to do that. They're able to just change change on a dime if they think they're wrong, and uh, that's very critical too. That's a that's a common thing. Gotcha. And uh, so how many of the market wizards like back, especially with the new with the, the first book that you wrote, the the, the market wizards, the original, um, were they all institutional or did they start retail and then switch to institutional to gr for more growth or like, you know, because there is there a certain ceiling as uh, as far as retail and they got to get start to explore like other people's money, not just their own money or like did some of them just start institutional. Like, what's your take on that? Well, in in. In most of the market wizard books that I that I did, I had both a mix of institutional and retail. So you had people who began. Uh, it, I think it may have been even in the first in the first book, maybe. In fact, in a lot of cases, they began. They might have began on their own, even if they ended up in institutional. You know, so uh, they had traders. You know, um, you know, like, like something like Paul Tudor Jones starts trading on his own, uh, gets a million, gets some, begins managing money for some other people, but eventually grows into Tudor Corp, which is, you know, tens of billions on the management or whatever. But it didn't start out that way. So, um, you know, it's, it's not delineated necessarily individual versus institution. And other traders are just starting. Well, it depends also on the theme of the book. And, Third market wizard book was hedge fund market wizards, or was the fourth? Uh, um, that was the fourth one. Hedge fund market wizards by the title. Okay, I'm looking for ins institutional traders, and uh, that was it was particularly hedge fund managers. Uh, there was one exception in there, but he wasn't and that's right, individual. He was he was still trading for a prop firm. Uh, everybody else was a hedge fund manager. That was the title of the book. The last one, unknown market wizards, specifically is non-institutional, looking specifically for people who are just, you know, individual traders. And so part of that is really just a matter of what the theme of the book is. And do you think that comes with the, like the change of the times, like the unknown market wizards, like now we have a, like a, like a lot of retail traders ever since the internet, like since 2010, I would say I started trading in 2016, but I studied some people that came prior to me, like their strategies and stuff. With retail and 2000 they started in 20, 2010 11 so that's when like the internet started to take off and like retail brokerages and even what i do mostly short selling new short selling specific brokerages started to pop up and then and then the pandemic happened everybody was home and given money and then you have lo and behold robin hood show up and that there's just a frenzy of retail everybody's trading and then like you know a lot of people lose money that way, but it's still like a lot of uh, a lot of people are introduced to trading. And like when you had the unknown market wizards, it actually is like focus on retail. Is it because like back in um the reason? OK, so the first market wizards books are back in the day. Um, retail, you have to call, for example, you have to call on the phone to get something done. Even back then when the money, you know, like would be like fifty dollars in fifty dollars out. Um, yeah. it was just really hard to trade. And how do you get like real time quotes without the internet every you know, access to the internet like like we have now? Like look look at this computer I have. Like this was not possible uh even 10 years ago, 20, 15 years ago. So now like, all the tools are available, everybody has access, it's almost really democratized. So like when you have the unknown market wizards now, it's like totally relevant. So is that one of the reasons why you decided to do it? Because like there was just a, a everyone's it's a big access yeah, to trade. <laughs> That would have been a good reason to, uh, for motivation. Actually, I, my th it really was because the previous book I had done was Hedge Fund Market Wizards. So I figured, well, let me do the exact opposite. You know, so that really, that quite honestly was a reason. Although what you mentioned is true. And there's certainly a lot more retail traders, although there's a lot more institutional traders too. There are a tremendous amount of more hedge funds as well. So I mean, God knows, I think it's like 20,000 or something. Uh, so, so both have grown tremendously, and you're right to point out the difference of people, young, young 
traders like yourself, uh, well, you're you're you seem to be aware of it, but may not fully appreciate what it, what it was really like back, say, when I was your age. Uh, you know, so you had no forget PCs were only in their infancy. So forget about software. You know, trading software. You know, even the PC was just in its infancy and wasn't actually widespread at all. Uh, it existed. I mean, it existed nearly. But the, the the people in the market, the first market wizards book, the PC, you know, for most of their trading career, the PC was not was not even you know there. So uh, you have that. You have, you don't have you don't even have charts. I mean, you you have chart services which maybe you get on a weekly basis, and then by hand you have to update it. Forget about intraday data, or let alone intraday charts, uh, and all the statistics like. Now, whatever you want, you can basically find databases with that, with that, those numbers and and all the statistics and everything else. Again, you know, didn't exist. Uh, I mean, I guess there was data around, but not easily accessible and very expensive, and the people didn't have computers to, to manipulate it. For the most part, not 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 retail people certainly. So it was a completely different world. Yeah, I just find that so interesting because. Uh... And then also, like, you had to place a phone call to your broker to make a trade, and the trade would be, like, 30 to $50, what I understand. And back then, that's, I mean, if you do the rate to now, I don't know, it's like $100 a trade, and, like, you're trading blind. Yeah. Commissions, uh, like, on the futures were, like, $50 to $100 around turn, which is, like, you know, like, 10 times what they are now. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big burden, really. Um so yeah, you had that, and you had to call. You had to call the broker, and you know you just couldn't. You couldn't just enter your own orders and stuff. Uh, there wasn't electronic trading. Also, that was you had trading in the pits. So it was, that was a diff big difference too. So it kind of a different world in, in many ways. Gotcha. So so okay. So you cover a wide range of markets. I think you specialized early on on futures, and I think Michael Marcus was futures. But then, like uh, you know, you. The market wizards, they cover everything. And even in the unknown market wizards, they covered small caps and even OTCs, which we'll get into uh, soon. But um, but yeah, so what was what was your area of focus or like your favorite market to cover and to, you know, to do research on? Especially, oh, yeah, so you were a research analyst or researching for Michael Marcus. So like how deep did you go into the research and like was it futures only? Yeah, actually, while uh, you know, when I when I was wor uh, working for MoneyScore, uh, I and my partner we were really working on tr developing <laughs> trading systems and stuff. So, uh, and it was futures. It was in futures markets, and uh, um, and and actually, we spent. It was one of my great blunders, uh, sort of be honest here. Um, you know, the fellow who worked with me, Norm Strom, was a physicist, really bright quant, and uh, he actually. You know, he did all the heavy lifting, but I, I kind of, I was like the more down person. So, you know, it was my decision of what to work on. And I, I had thought this was early on and, and so the, the idea of working on trading systems was, was okay. It was fine. But I, um, I had this idea that um, the way to do it to me seemed logical. I said, well, we should, what we really should do is we should figure out we should come up with the methodology for optimizing, you know, op optimizing what is the best systems to use for each market and stuff like that. And once we build this op optimization framework, we can then do individual systems and we can feed a whole bunch of systems and let, let this methodology pick the best systems and, and combine them and all that. Now it seems logical, uh, except, and we, and we built it, <laughs> It ended up being a thick binder, and we built this kind of what seemed impressive, mainly because Norm's you know, quantitative skill. But it was essentially the, the, to simplify it. It was like using a um, a uh, center of mass concept, meaning that you would analyze systems on various qualities of the system and uh, look for areas like which had the largest concentration of success. Uh, sort of like a mass and then uh, mathematically that's what it was equivalent to. But what I discovered, and this is why it was wrong-headed, what, what I discovered after all of this is that optimization didn't work. Uh, that that systems that were the best 
in, in, you know, in the past year might end up being the worst in the next year. There was really no stability to what worked best in the markets. And so this whole optimization thing, which we spent all this time on, ended up really not being useful. And, um, you know, so anyway, that, that, but that is, it ended up being a project that, that didn't work out because of, because I had a wrong headed idea. Gotcha. So interesting. So what I'm understanding, okay, so you mentioned this last time that institutions, they, ha they have like teams of like PhDs and psychologists and mathematicians and all, and all this. And they, maybe they, I think in my head, I'm imagining some pods and like of, of, uh, groups of, of people like this, hundreds of people sometimes in institutions working on this. And they're like, these days, I imagine them creating like algos. So is this, is this accurate? Like they'll have like teams of mathematicians, quants and psychologists, PhDs working together to create, to come up with algos that be based off of human behavior of traders or retail traders, to, you know, to take advantage, <laughs> take their money. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, and actually they're, they're all, they're, they're all sacred for good reason. So you're not, not going to tell exactly what they're doing. Um, but essentially, uh, what, I, what I'm assuming is, yes, they have, where they work, some may, you know, I guess there may be some that work in individual small groups, some in larger groups. Uh, but they're all coming up with models looking for inefficiencies in the market. Now, those inefficiencies, I'm sure, uh, a lot of those inefficiencies must be based on, on retail behavior, retail trader behavior and exploiting the mistakes of retail traders. That would be an area of inefficiency in the market that they potentially would exploit. And a lot of it has to do, and they also are trading, diversification ends, tends up being a really critical thing because they're trading uh, extraordinary wide ranges of markets and different instruments. And, and they're also balancing the risk and, uh, of, of, and correlations of different instruments and so forth. So the whole portfolio uh, ends up looking good. So you might have trades going on that are not, profitable for themselves, but end up reducing the risk because they, they tend to work when other things don't. So it's, so that there's definitely, a am sure there's a level of sophistication, which goes far beyond just individual systems, but talk, looking at the integration of all the systems and, and giving weight to things, not just on how they perform individually, but how they interrelate with the rest of the portfolio. So, um, and as far as there's all sorts of different quantitative approaches that can be used. And that's why there's so many different, you know, different people have different areas of expertise. I'm sure some of it will may involve cyclical, you know, work, uh, uh, you know, or anything you can think of uh, that might, it's, might extract some sort of edge. You know, they don't have to be, they don't need anything to be super, super, super successful. If, if, if anybody can develop, uh, a thousand different systems that each have a 51% edge and are unrelated, they'll do very, you know, well. So that's, it's ba It's not that they're getting a tremendous, they have these great systems that are just super, super uh, powerful of forecasting. It's more a matter of they're finding small edges in thousands of places and the combination gives you a really good overall performance. Gotcha. So now to shift to the unknown market wizards. So the unknown market wizards, um, who was your favorite person to interview there? Uh, for example, I found Jeffrey Newman super interesting, but who was your, your favorite one? Yeah. So Jeffrey Newman was one of them. Um, I, I also, I also enjoyed that, that interview. Um, and it was a long interview. I, I, uh, actually slept over in his guest house. So, you know, we, uh, uh, we can hear the next morning. I think almost all the usable stuff that was from the first day. But uh, so Jeff Newman was was very interesting because of a story going from a few thousand to at the time fifty million, which he has since then multiplied several times over. Um, and and his stories, you know, his 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 anecdotes and all of that were quite quite, quite uh, interesting. The way he picks up these trends very early and. Uh, and the one, if I had to say the one I found, I guess my personal favorite was probably Chris Camillo. And Chris, uh, Chris was unusual, uh, in fact, super unusual to me, 
because he had developed this uh, a style of trading, which was not even in my universe of definitions of types of trading. So I had always assumed, you know, like a coin, you flip a coin, there's heads and tails, you know, it's not heads, tails and sideways, you know, you don't consider it a sideways, it's heads or tails. There's like two types. And I always thought all, all trading strategies are, they're either fundamental base, you know, statistics, uh, economics, whatever, or they're technical base, whether it's charts or, or some other price oriented uh, technical information uh, or some combination of the two. But I, you know, what else is there? In Camillo, I discovered there was a guy who came up with a completely different concept. He didn't use fundamentals and he didn't look at charts or, or use that. Technically, he used neither, and that's the title of the chapter, neither. He used neither fundamentals nor technical. What he used was social media. And uh, he was extremely successful in using social media to, to trade. And uh, so that, and then he had all these interesting stories about, you know, how, how social media led him into, into various trades that were, that were very successful. So in a way, was he using social media to gauge like the trends? He was using social media to see, looking at changes and looking at what what people. There was he was looking for things that had a big sudden spike uh, in in people's uh, enthusiasm. Like what Twitter was a big thing for him at that time, um, and so if you would look then you see there's a tremendous amount of uh, of tweets on uh, on on let's say a new Netflix program. And I think of like a strange, was a stranger things. I, I wasn't a series that I watched, but he mentioned like, he noticed that the, that lots of hit shows, they have they're like big for a week or two of a lot of, lot of conversation. And then, um, and then, you know, but, but then they fade, they begin to fade. But in that case, it just persisted, you know, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And sort of, he knew that, 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 Netflix was going to have this this incredible earnings because of that that that, that this people were not appreciating how big of an impact that was going to, was going to be um, you know uh, so anyway that's those those were the types of things that we would pick up on so interesting and Jeffrey Newman to backtrack a little bit he's the guy that did the uh, capitalize on sponge tech while he was on a safari so right yeah. that was that was the one and um. What, so for him, he was trading his own money. So like, but in order for it to grow it, like exponentially hundreds of millions, like you're saying, um, did he like start a hedge fund and like, you know, or no, grow to something no. else? This is, this is his own money. He literally, he literally compounded a few thousand to a few hundred million, uh, literally. And I, I can say that with total confidence because he said, you know, I have a statement. He sent me his statements. Uh, although I will say, I haven't seen the statements. Uh, I just as I've spoken to him since I did the book. Uh, so from the fifty million on onward, uh, I haven't seen his track record, uh, but I have no reason to doubt. The, you know, I, I I believe him. I trust him. And yeah. so uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, this was totally just never managed anybody's money. No, this is totally his own money, and literally, literally began with. Well, it was a seven, I think it was like, if I remember correctly, a $7,000 account, but $5,000 worth something in it were like in a stock that is, that was never there, but the account came from his father. I forget what, you know, they inherited it or whatever, but uh, he only had like two, three thousand dollars that he actually started trading with. And back then he started with petty stocks and on a strategy, which became obsolete in about a year, you know, but each time something became you know, stop working. He went on, to, and for first number of years, he really did focus on on penny stocks, and uh, not an area I recommend people get into. But you know, he for him it was very very successful. You know, uh, uh, he think he found, and in fact, uh, Sponge Sponge uh, Sponge Tech Sponge Tech was one of those stocks uh, which was super successful for himself. But he, what he saw was. That there was inside of the insiders had like four, like I don't know, million, two million shares of it one day or something, and so he just he bought it on that premise, and it ended up Sponge Tech ended up being a bit of a scam, 
Um, so all it was, <laughs> it was really literally a sponge, a sponge with soap in it. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's what it was. But they had, they were advertising on uh, like football, you know, major football, uh, NFL games and, and tennis matches, and they would have the sponge deck banner. And the thing is, they scammed the, they scammed the, uh, the, to get the advertising, they, they, they were, they were scammers and that they never pay, they never fully paid. They paid something, but they, they never really paid for it. And, uh, but they got all this advertising and people and the stock was going up. So the people started getting excited about, you know, because the stock was going up and there's not many things behind it. Uh, and Jeff Newman was very good at riding the trend as long as it went. So he, he just stayed with it. But at some point he was on, an, uh, a safari in Africa and had no, he had no phone. This is a pre, I don't remember if it's a pre cell phone or uh, if it's not pre cell phone, he didn't, there was no reception. I think there's probably no, I think it's a matter of difference. He probably had a Blackberry in those days, but there was no reception. Uh, and he had to go to the office to kind of find out what's going, you know, to make a call. But he, but at the time it had gone up into the high 20s and he just sold it all. And, um, and it ended up being, you know, ended up being, I think, like right near, right the high day or something like that. So maybe some of it's luck, but some of these traders are luck. Be, you can call it luck, but there's some sort of instinct there. I don't know what, you know. Uh -huh. And um, with with him, so okay, so Sponge Tech was an OTC, I believe. I, I, I'm pretty sure yeah. it was. It started at a few yeah, cents, exactly. and it went to. It was never listed. No. Yeah, so so did he trade all types for him? I mean, to grow to uh the way he did over a hundred million or whatever he's at now, you can't just trade OTCs. So like, does he trade no, like? Okay, uh, no, no, no. So he trade, you know, he trades other stock. You know, he eventually expanded and you know to to a broad range of stocks. But yeah. he started out. That was the start. Was in in these penny stocks and stuff. Um, uh, yeah. So that's that's that was a start. And um, so you you mentioned, OK, so one of the wizards in the unknown market wizards, Michael Kahn, talks about shorting biotechs. So was there any other short uh, traders besides him that are sh like short biased? Uh, short by. Well, no, Michael Kahn was uh, he was the only one that I'm thinking. Well, some of the other traders that trade the futures, of course, if you trade futures, by definition, long short is no. You know, you go long, you go short. It's it's uh, there's no there's no distinction. Uh, uh -huh. It's unlike I should explain to people not familiar futures. Uh, basically, if futures markets still. Um, if you look at a broad range, if you adjust, if you adjust prices for, um, you know, let me try to keep this. I don't want to get too 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 much on a tangent, but when futures they trade for just specific dates. And when you go from one future's most liquid, go to the next one, one expires, there's usually a gap between one price and the other. And uh, depending on the market, but most often they'll tend to be the, the further market will tend to be, the more distant will be traded a premium uh, to take into account uh, the fact that the interest rate differential that, that you lose by not being able to keep the money in interest. So so that's that the future markets reflect that. And if you take, if you adjust for that and just look at, so if you buy, if you go over one month to another, let's say you're buying, you're buying it then at a higher price. But if you, you know, if you buy, let's say you go from one contract that's at, at $100 and you go to the next contract, which is 102, you haven't made $2. That, and you know, so when that, if that goes from 102 to 104, you've made $2, you haven't made $4. So if you adjust prices for uh, not counting the we, the, the fan, phantom moves, which are just moving from one country to another, futures markets tend to move in wide ranges. They don't they don't show that like a big secular trend like stock index futures. Even stock index futures will be will not show as much of a trend. Although stocks have had a very long trend that exists besides that. But currencies, for example, uh, lots of markets interest rate. They tend to um, they tend to go both ways. Uh, so futures traders will trade both sides. So in that case, all the traders who are futures traders, by definition, will be long and short. Uh, but for stock traders, uh, 
very few traders are um, uh, short focused and Kane isn't either. He balances, he has part of his portfolio short selling, particularly biotech supporting uh, the specific approach he uses. Um, and, and he balances that with, with a portfolio of long stocks uh, and uh, which is a completely different strategy. Um, and so uh, he, he's not a short seller in that sense. He's combining a short strategy with a long strategy to reduce his risk. Gotcha. So, um, but as far as the short strategy in the book, uh, I think I remember him saying, or like the, the chapter that was covered on him saying that most biotechs fail. So he approaches the small cap biotech or the biotech sector in general, um, with the short bias, uh, and I want to know. I want to ask you, like, what do you remember? What he looks for as far as uh, what his 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 short strategy for those biotechs that he was talking that you were talking about. Yeah, he's specific. He, the chapter is specific, and you know, I have to. You know, I did that. The 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 interview now is about uh, four years old or whatever. But I I think um, that he's looking for. Um, that that most of these, uh, as you mentioned, particularly the the smaller cap stocks, that they're going to uh, uh, to uh, phases, uh, you know, where they're. Oh, that's phase, right. Uh, what's that? I think it was phase phase one or the early phase, phases. Yeah, phase, yeah. yeah, phase one too. So it's very, it's almost an unheard of for these small cap stocks to really have come up all of a sudden for a big thing, and and usually there's a lot of hype and. And when it gets the actual, uh, actual, uh, you know, getting approval, not getting approval, they don't get approved, and and most of them fail. So he's 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 working on that premise uh, to to a large extent on the shorts. Gotcha. So so with the with the updated version to the unknown market wizards, what's uh what's the primarily the difference? Uh, the, the the difference between the oh, well the difference in the updated and the the original the the updated has the, the entire original text, but what the updated has is at the end of each chapter, the book came out uh, just before COVID, you know, just before COVID. And then, and then we had COVID hit and we had a big bear market, which didn't last very long. And then we had a big bull market, you know, and there were some really wild times in there. And so, and then we had another bear market, you know, and then now we're back to a bull phase. But so we had two bear markets uh, after the book came out and this bull phase between them. And um, I was curious, basically, that how they, these traders navigated these kind of unprecedented, in some sense, unprecedented, having, having, having a, um, an epidemic certainly of that time of that of that extent was unprecedented so uh, i mean in in modern times so i i thought you know, i was curious and i'm sure readers would be curious well okay they did great but yeah how do they do especially with those two bear markets so so i want to go back and and up you know do updates with them what happened after the last year of interview i what were the trading experience in the subs in a more recent three years, basically, and uh, basically all of them did did well. Oddly enough, I mean, so I was surprised that well, some did spectacularly well, um, and so that was the that was the motivation was to to do uh, an uh, an update section for each chapter. What happened afterwards? Because I'm you know I'm sure that people would be curious about that, and so. So that's what said. That was the premise of the, of the update. Now, the the update came out. The original book is a hardback, and then it was coming out in paperback. So that was a catalyst. So since it was coming up in a different format, and the hardback was going to be, you know, I sort of once the paperback comes out, the hardback stops selling for the most part. But I thought it would be well. I might as well do do these updates and make it part of the paperback. So. So there'd be more than just a reissue and a paperback, but it would actually have new material. And there's about, I'd say about 25% new text, you know, additional text in the in the paperback versus the original version. Gotcha. So for the, when you were and finding- I should say one, you know, one other difference was that um, at the same time, my son had said to me, you know, dad, you, 
you know, why you know, I should, you know, be good. You know, I'm sure people will be curious to have, you know, an interview, interview you in a book. Well, I was very hesitant because I said, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a great, I'm not a Marco wizard. I don't want to get, and uh, anyway, so what I did is I threw it out to my editor, who I trust a lot um, and it's been very helpful. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. So, okay. So I said, well, that's, I couldn't have any, I couldn't be objective about what we're doing. So I let my son interview me and that became the last chapter. And I think I titled it Not a Market Wizard Chapter or something like that, uh, just to be clear. Awesome. Awesome. I'm looking forward to reading all, all the updates and um, and getting your, your specific interview from your, from the eyes of your, from the view of your son. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so I want to ask you also, so how did, how did you find the, the, the unknown market wizards? I, from what I remember, I think there was a, a software called fun Cedar that you yeah. had the traders update upload and then you would see their stats. Is that how it was? Yeah, that was part of it. So I was, uh, I was involved in this startup, uh, called fun Cedar and, uh, basically provides a platform for traders to, link their accounts, uh, not from all brokers, but from some brokers, and um, and then see a whole bunch of analysis on their on their results. And the idea of that was then that was that was their uh, not that wasn't sold, that was provided free. And the money making idea or the idea where the where the income generation would come was we'd be able to find traders who were good and then use them in, in a sister company to form a hedge fund and uh, and, and go from there. So um, that was the basic concept. Anyway, so some of the traders that were in Fun Cedar, yes, ended up being in, ended up being the source for that book. I also knew some of the traders. Uh, uh, again, I knew some of the traders personally. Um, uh, and uh, then the third method, the third way that I got uh, got people for the book was. I did a tweet where I said, hey, I'm doing a new Market Wizards book. If you're one or no one, uh, let me know. And I got hundreds of suggestions. And uh, some of those are the ones that ended up in the book. Awesome. So what was there anyone that surprised you when you were, especially when you're looking at their stats on Funseed or out of nowhere, or like even what the suggestions you got on Twitter that just surprised you and blew you away? You're like, this can't be real. And then uh, you, you investigated and was like, oh, it's, it's, it's real. Well, like it's real. Yeah, there's a number of them uh, there. Well, I, well, it, it, once, the ones on Fun Cedar I knew were real because that's the whole premise of Fun Cedar. We get the, they get the results directly from, we don't get it from the trader. The results are directly from a link with the broker. So I knew those, I knew any results from Fun Cedar traders were real. So, uh, you know, we have a guy, uh, like Richard Barge or something like that, uh, uh, you know, several hundred percent a year, uh, you know, every year. Um, but you know, it doesn't sound believable, but I knew it was real. So, uh, so, so in the case of unseated traders, I knew they were real. And if somebody like like Newman, who we just Jeff Newman, we discussed, uh, um, you know, or, or Camilla, or and Jeff Newman is most, is probably the most spectacular one in terms of performance. But again, I knew it was real because I, I get the statements in those cases. So, so um, it was not surprising because before I interview somebody, I have to know it's I have to know it's for real because um, otherwise, it, it, when you told the numbers, in fact, Newman's case, uh, he sent me an email a year or so before I, I decided to do the book saying, hey, you know, you may not believe this, but this is my story. He just mentioned that, you know, he had started with just a few thousand, built it up to, to this, to this uh, huge, you know, 50 million. And um, I, you know, I, I wrote him back, hey, I'm not planning another a book, but uh, if I, I'll keep your email on file. And if I do, uh, and you can prove it to me, I'll, 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 I'll be a great story. So, when I decided to do a book, I, I emailed him and said, "Yay, I'm doing another book, and if you can send me a statement, so uh, I'd be, you know, and they, you know, and they verify what you're selling me, I'd be, you know, very happy to do the interview." So he, he provided me the statements, and you know, <laughs> but of course, I mean, I can't take it for granted because those, the, it sounds unbelievable. 
Yeah. So would you say Newman is the most like uh, extraordinary case from like a few thousand to hundreds of millions? Uh, yeah, like... I would say probably in all five Market Wizards books, the single most spectacular, even even out, even eclipsing Marcus took eighty thousand took eighty thousand into eighty million. Okay, uh, but it's still not it's still not three thousand into. Uh, into 200 million you know so um so I, I i think newman is probably the most spectacular uh performance i've ever encountered gotcha so i want to get your thoughts also on the future of trading involvement with um the advent of technologies like ai and algorithmic trading any any thoughts on that yeah um well uh it's it's being used now um i i'm not i don't know it's not like I have statistics and I could say, you know, these firms are doing this, what they're doing. And I'm sure, and you'll hear about the ones that are doing it successfully. I'm sure there's other ones that are not successful. Um, what I will say though is this, is that um, it's not the death knell that people think it is necessarily for trading as it is has been for a lot of other things. So for example, uh, back 15, 20 years ago, people would have said, well, no way a computer is going to ever beat a grandmaster. Of course, you know, within maybe eight, 10 years ago, now, you know, we've, we've passed the point where the best grandmaster can't come close to, 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 to being, beating the computer. Um, and there was an interesting um, uh, side of this. It's like the difference between, the difference between um, trading and something like chess or go, which is even more complex than chess in, in, in a number of combinations, uh, tremendously more combinations that can occur. But those are games which are defined. I mean, there are rules, they don't change, you know, in, in chess, the, the knight will go two and one over. It, the knight doesn't sometimes go two and one over and sometimes go diagonally. It's it, the rules are fixed, okay? The board's always the same. The pieces are set up the same. All the rules are the same. Um, the difference in, in, in trading is that the rules are always changing. So you have times, let's say, where high interest, higher interest rates will go for rising stock market. There are times where higher interest rates will go for lower stock market. There are times where there's no correlation between the two. And things... And, all the different factors are always changing like that. And you go in times where human emotion isn't the factor and you go from times where human emotion is the only factor, like the internet bubble, it was all human emotion. Throw fundamentals out of the window completely. In fact, there was a handicap if you're paying attention to the, if you're paying attention to the fundamentals of these companies, that was a tremendous handicap because the worst companies went up the most in many cases. So, um, and things are, but but that doesn't stay. Then that that changes completely, and then it can reverse completely. And so it's that changing nature of how inputs that impact the market go not only go in and out of importance. You know, sometimes they're important, sometimes they're not. But they even change in their directional impact. And I think that makes it a much more a, 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 an order of complexity more difficult for AI to handle or anybody, I guess, because AI is really looking for patterns and those patterns can change dramatically. So I'm, I'm, I should say in preface, I should have prefaced all this by saying, I'm, I'm completely ignorant of AI. I don't, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't want to come off it talking like I know about AI. I've never worked on AI. I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know anything about AI. I mean, other than most of them, everybody knows. But I understand what the problem would be in applying AI to markets and why it's not going to be as solvable as a lot of other things that AI is applied to. Gotcha. So with that, so like, uh, how do you continue to learn and stay informed about the markets? Myself? Yeah, because like you're you're in tune with AI with this and well, all the no, all the I, unknown markets. No, I just no, I'm just I just you know. I, I read uh, um, and I just not that I'm a former Marcus, I'm informed to some extent on what's going on generally. 
just from reading, you know, I'll, I'll give a plug here. Um, and just in general, I mean, one, one great, one great thing I'd like is Apple News, uh, because it just gives you every day gives you access to not only a bunch of different newspapers and magazine, you know, mag and magazines, um, and the whole spectrum of, of different, uh, different writing. So just reading something like that, which I read every day. So just reading like something like that, which gives you a whole spectrum of different publications, um, keeps you informed. So that's, so that's like one reason why I, I stay up to date on things and, you know, I'll read books of course and stuff, but, uh, um, yeah, I'm no more, you know, I'm not, I don't stay it's informed particularly on the markets other than it's like anything else. Uh, so. Gotcha. So you don't have like Bloomberg terminal and, and, uh, no, 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 I <laughs> yeah. don't, I don't. And I'll say, like I said, I'm not a trader per se. And so, uh, and when I, what trading I do is technically oriented. So it's not even based on any fundamentals or whatever. So, gotcha. uh, yeah. Gotcha. So I want to, okay. So the updated version of the unknown market wizards, is that, is that out yet? Or when does it come oh, out? Yeah, what, it what are the out, details? Yeah, it came out in November. So, uh, okay. yeah, it's, it's been out a couple of months. Great. So I'll have a month and a half, I should say. Gotcha. So I'll have that in the show notes. I'm pretty sure everyone can get that for a gift for the, the holidays coming up. And, um, yeah, Jack, thank you so much for taking the time to come on once again. It's really great having you on. You've, uh, okay. yeah, a lot of traders uh, love hearing these podcasts. So, yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Okay, David, good speaking. All right, Jack. I'll see you. Bye. Take care. Bye.